Hey there, What Next TBD listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. What Next TBD is brought to you by Progressive. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate. Then their tool will provide options from other companies so that you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Welcome to my 2023 Hinge Wrapped. This year, I swiped or was swiped on 1,330 times, had 105 matches, was unmatched 18 times, went on 17 first dates, had zero relationships, and said the words, why are men approximately 1 billion times? Rachel Stein has been playing the dating game for a while, specifically the dating app game. I've been on the apps for two plus years now. I used them previously, like when I was in my mid-20s for about a year, and then I stopped for a period of time. And then it was the pandemic, and I was like, "Mm, this is maybe not for me right now. And I got back on in 2022. Rachel's now 30 years old and she lives in Brooklyn and she decided to track her most recent round of dating and make a video of her 2023 dating stats. I also encountered five other people with avocado allergies, was swiped on the most by people named Alex 22 times, followed closely by Michaels who swiped on me 20 times. Alex is also the most popular name I swiped on four times, but ultimately I went out with zero Alexes. Why am I still single? Three words, low quality men. As you can tell from Rachel's video, her luck on dating apps, she mostly uses Hinge, has not been great. And I was talking to a friend of mine, I was like, Does it, is it really that like the quality of people changed or did I get standards? And he was like, I think you got standards. So maybe it has just always been bad and I've just reevaluated my approach to who I am choosing to talk to and meet. Yeah, coming back after a month away was kind of disheartening. I'll be honest with you. I have never used dating apps before. I met my husband just as dating apps were starting to become a thing, definitely before they went mainstream. There were dating slash matchmaking websites like OkCupid and eHarmony. At eHarmony, we use a scientific system to help you find someone who's looking for someone like you. We're a real couple. We have our but millennials and Gen Z have been using different tools for love since around the 2010s. Apps that started booming when I got married, your Tinder, Hinge, Bumble, Zeus, God bless you. Those are where the kids are finding love. Or... Are they? Over the last few years, the internet seems to have fallen out of love with dating apps. If you come across a video that says that people that have to date right now are in the f-ing trenches, we mean it. None of us are desperate enough, girls, for hinge dating. If you're someone who met their partner off a dating app at any point in the last like year and a half, two years, just know that you caught the last chopper out of NOM. And the companies behind the apps are feeling the disconnect. According to a report by Morgan Stanley, the dating app industry has seen a fall off in user growth in 2023. And a survey of college students conducted by Axios and the Generation Lab in October of last year found that 80% of respondents do not use dating apps. Meanwhile, the apps are attempting to monetize a service that's long been free, introducing things like subscription models that offer unlimited swipes or provide boosts for your profile. 
And this is all further fueling users' negative feelings about the apps. So what's dating like now? Are the singles flocking to IRL meetups? I have proposed to many friends and acquaintances. I was like, maybe let's go to like an in-person event and like meet (laughs) people in person or just like talk to strangers at bars. Radical idea. Absolutely radical. I, I know. It's crazy. Today on the show, with more singles willing to mingle but unwilling to pay for it, has America broken up with dating apps? I'm Shayna Roth, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary. You're listening to What Next TBD, a show about tech, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. Apple Card is a credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, the supply chain has been a friend and foe to my company. Can AI make us more resilient? Signed, Supply Chain to Uncertainty. Hey Supply, here's how AI in the supply chain can help. AI can massively automate data analytics and understand the movement of your goods. AI can point out weak links, market demand trends, optimal logistics, and other important aspects that impact the top and bottom lines for the business. Take the example of a large grocery chain that has hundreds of vendors spread through the country. In some cases, you may need to reroute shipments to other stores, such as in the case of fresh produce, a good that can go bad very fast. Managing such a supply chain is heavily dependent on the data provided, and AI can help optimize this information so that your supply chain works at its optimal levels. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. I love a good meet cute. You know the scene in a romantic comedy where the two characters destined for happily ever after by the time the credits roll meet each other for the first time? One of my favorites is in 1999's Notting Hill, when Hugh Grant's goofy bookstore salesman spills coffee on Julia Roberts' glamorous movie star. Oh, oh God. God. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Here, let me... Uh, Get your hands off. I'm really sorry. I'm... I love these scenes. They feel so nostalgic because they're happening in person between two people. But for millennials and younger generations, the meet cute has been happening on a slew of dating apps that have been around for over a decade. And in the beginning, it seemed to offer a revolutionary way to meet people. The introduction of app dating really changed the reputation of online dating, where it went from being this sort of, ooh, weird, what's that thing, to something totally, if not normal, novel and exciting that people were trying out. That's Catherine Lindsay. She covers internet culture and recently wrote about how dating apps, now decades old, are in their so-called flop era for bustle. It kind of gave it a rebrand that it was for anyone looking to date, not like people who were having trouble dating. So these companies popped up and they, you know, Tinder was a big one, Grindr was an early one, and they all were predicated on a very simple premise, which is just people near you who are on the app and have made a profile. And there were really the only barrier to entry was that they also liked you and then you would match. In that sense, it was like exactly what it said it was going to be. Like you literally are just swiping through all the available singles and looking for your options. That's great, but that does not make a company 
money um, or like unless you're paying for it. And so different things have happened. Like obviously they can do advertising, but um, the big thing, the big change over the years that I think is responsible for this feeling that dating apps don't work anymore is really that like dating apps don't work for free anymore. In a push to shore up slowing revenue growth that started in 2022, the apps have started slowly but surely adding in paid for incentives and subscriptions like unlimited swipes and tools to help boost your chances of getting a match. And while the free version may not be ideal anymore, users have shown that they aren't itching to pay money for a better shot at love. Match.com, which owns Tinder, saw its paying users decline for four straight quarters. And research from Pew found that only 22% of online dating users under 30 have paid money on a dating app before. One tool in particular hinges Rose feature has left users uniquely frustrated. The only way users can interact with these so-called standouts, profiles that get a lot of attention and engagement, is to send them a rose. So you have a limited number of roses that you as a free user can send. And when you've used them all, you either can't send any more or you have to buy more or you can like join the subscription model. Like there's a few options, but you basically, you need to pay if you want to, if you want to go beyond what is allotted to you as a free user. And I just think despite things like subscriptions, streaming services, things like that, people do not like to pay for stuff, especially stuff that they previously got for free. It's a classic thing. They get everyone on board and they slowly start monetizing things. And so I think the the issue with roses is one, people don't want to pay because they didn't need to before. But also I think with dating specifically, I think finding love, finding a match feels like a right that people have. And I think users really resent the idea that it is becoming more of like a cash grab, that companies are monetizing at the expense of their potential future happiness, family. Like these are not, you know, dating is one thing, but dating is not insignificant because sort of presumably lots of people date because they want to meet their long-term partner and start a family. And I think the idea of that being gatekept Um, even with something as small as someone runs out of roses and they have to pay more, I think really gets under the skin of people. And if you're paying for the service, you expect to get some bang for your buck. But simply paying to boost your profile doesn't guarantee that you'll increase your matches. Because of this, the concept of gaming the dating apps, that if you set your profile up in a certain way with certain pictures, you're likely to get more matches, has cropped up in the past few years. It's an effort to overcome one of the more frustrating parts of these apps. No one really understands the ins and outs of how they work. And the companies aren't transparent about how they match you either, which, understandably, can lead to some serious user anxiety. The thing is, like, none of the apps are ever really going to come out and say, like, this is 100% how we determine this. But someone who's getting, like, a lot of attention, getting a ton of likes, getting a ton of matches, that information is going to be used about them to sort of mark them as desirable if they're getting sort of an unprecedented number of people swiping right on them. Also, you're handing over a lot of data when you make a dating app. You're you're literally telling them what it is you want and they can use all that to cater to you. Tinder has introduced new features because they're trying to rebrand away from being a hookup app because lots of these apps came in and tried to get their own corner of the market or the way that they would turn out to be used would be specific. And so like Tinder was seen for hookups where I think Hinge was always seen for relationships. Tinder is trying to change that reputation. And so one of the things they have is that you can explicitly put like, I am looking for a relationship and someone else will put that. And so then your experience will be changed based on that. And so you're you're handing them a lot of stuff and they presumably, but like I said, they're never going to come out and explain their algorithms, are using that to determine who gets put in front of you. But in ways, obviously they have to make money in ways that also keep you on the app. So it's, you know, I can't make any concrete accusations, but I have to imagine they're towing a line too, because they don't want you to leave the app. There's apps like Hinge who market themselves as being, you know, designed to be deleted, which seems contradictory to, you know, sort of capitalism. You know, these are all designed to make money. Is it that users feel they're getting 
contradictory messages from the apps themselves that is making this that is also causing this sort of friction? Yeah, actually, that was someone in the piece basically said like, okay, you can do all this, but don't keep your slogan designed to be deleted. Like, so I think there was a specific anger at claiming to be one thing, but clearly the actions of monetization and other things were counter to that. I think it really is a lot about betrayal and anger at the apps kind of doing this switch up on them. When we come back, Are the younger generations posing an existential crisis for the apps? First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. Apple Card is a credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverage you want like comprehensive and collision coverage, or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies, all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Let's talk a little bit about the generational divide that's been going on here. It feels like the Gen Zers are coming in. The millennials have been hanging around for a while. I mean, some of the big players like your Grindr, Tinder, Hinge, I mean, they came out over a decade ago when they were largely apps that millennials used. How are millennials feeling these days about these apps? They're the people that these apps really first came out for. So as far as how they're approaching it, I do think 2014 is a a good date to kind of say when this boom began. And now we're now 10 years later. And so you can kind of imagine if you are not someone who has been successful in a dating app in those 10 years, you're probably a little bit tired of it. And it's 10 years of it uh, sensibly not working in the way that you wanted it to if your goal was to find a partner and get married. And so I think... Millennials, after 10 years of being on the option and not working, are the ones that are still using them are a little bit um, just exhausted. But it's not just that millennials are burnt out from their lack of success on dating apps. The younger generations are a wholly different group of users with different dating habits and challenges for the apps. They seem to be less interested in hookups. They want to use the app to find a relationship. So I think that's where you can see like Tinder doing its rebrand. There's a new app called Archer that is for queer users, but it also, it's about for dating and friendship in the sense that they noticed a lot of people, a lot of queer people were using dating apps and leaving with a friend versus using it and actually meeting a partner. And and it also is designed a bit more like a social media platform where people can sort of respond to prompts, share photos. It's a bit more interactive. And so both of those things are them kind of seeing how Gen Z, like Gen Z is really native to social platforms. And so they want to have the the dating app look like the social platforms are already on and they want to adapt to how it is 
they're dating, which is, you know, they, for queer users, it's, they use these apps for finding community in many different ways. And then for Gen Z in general, they seem to be using dating apps with the goal of finding love and less about hooking up. It's a weird thing because you're kind of, now you have to please two different generations. One is millennials who are tired and annoyed. And then there's Gen Z who's new and also uses it a bit differently. And so I think that's another reason why it's like, they're never going to please anyone. Do you think that COVID played a role in sort of what the different generations are looking for? Yes. The super interesting thing from these conversations is I, I talked to people who were like in their mid twenties. So there were Gen Z or early millennial, but basically people who a lot of their time when they would have been having formative dating experiences was during lockdown. And um, so when I asked each person, like if you were going to design your ideal dating app, what would it look like? All of them said something that rather than doing the meeting on the internet and then going on a date, they want something that helps them meet in real life. Because I think that is a skill that due to sort of two years of Zoom school or Zoom work and moving and graduating and not being able to really um, gain those meeting people skills. They're like, I need help with with that. I don't know how to approach someone at a bar. Mm. Or there's a concern, especially with Gen Z, a real awareness of you don't want to approach someone or uh, make someone uncomfortable. And I think, and that's like a good impulse to have, obviously, but I do think there's a, it means that they just err on the side of not going up to someone at a bar. And I think the app that people would describe that they wanted is something that just gets a bunch of single people who are open to being approached romantically, get them all in a room and then let them all just talk to each other. (laughs) I'm sorry, this is a singles mixer. They want a singles mixer. (laughs) And some of the, some of the apps are like getting on top of that. They're like, okay, we can do that. And so I know like um, Hinge just announced a fun Tinder, did like a summer series. So the the apps are responding to it, but it's so interesting that like history just repeats itself over and over again, but they're familiar with apps. So like if the app can do it, then I'll do it. But I think if they were to see just like an ad for a singles mixer, they wouldn't go. But if Tinder's like, we're doing a singles mixer, they're like, well, I know Tinder. I'm familiar with that. So I will will go to it. (laughs) One can only hope that they bring, but this all of this results in like Jane Austen level balls yeah, coming yes, back. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm curious if you think that what has happened with dating apps and the prevalence of dating apps is in part due to sort of shifting norms around workplace dating. I feel like before the apps and even, you know, as early as maybe 10 years ago, it was, it was much more normal to date somebody that you work with and... Now it seems like what is acceptable in the workplace has kind of changed a lot. And even just like in general, because of COVID, like whether or not we're in an office and like we even see our coworkers has changed. Do you think that's played a role in any of this? This isn't directly related to workforce, but I do think also a big part of this shift is just norms and expectations in general. I do think from some of the conversations I've had, the idea of you have to grow up, meet someone, get married, have kids, nuclear family is pretty gone. And some of the people I spoke to said like, one of the reasons why it can be hard, I think, to find someone and settle down is because there's not that pressure to find someone and settle down. And they, a lot of people have said, you know, like if I don't find the person I want to be with, like if I don't find like my soulmate, then I will... There, There's obviously layers of financial privilege and other stuff to this, but they're like, I will have a kid by myself. The norms around like what success looks like just like in life um, doesn't necessarily include settling down with one partner having a kid anymore. And I think that also changes the goal of dating apps for people or the role of them where it's like, I guess if that doesn't work in the time frame they've allotted, they'll just figure out like having a family a different way. It seems like this could be a very existential moment for these apps, particularly when you've got these two very different generations like trying to figure out like what they want and help them out and service them. Are they are they doing a good job with with managing that um, and and building up their reputations, or are they you know a few botched singles mixers away from getting defunct? <laughs> it's hard because it's like how well they are at helping people date almost has nothing to do with whether or not they're going to succeed because it's like the outlook right now is Match Group, which owns a ton of these apps. They're not getting paying users. Their shares are dropping. Um, The Bubble CEO just left. There's a lot. And like Field just did a rebrand that was like pretty disastrous. 
In terms of long-term viability, they're having a bit of a shaky moment, it seems. And I think a big problem with that is there's just so many of them. And, and, and like we've said, like if everyone suddenly finds love and leaves, that's not good for them either. And so, I mean, to be honest, it's kind of an impossible industry to win at because if you do well for your users, you won't have as many. But if you do poorly for them in order to sort of earn more money, they're going to be mad at you too. And so... I think some of the key players will stick around. I think certain ones that don't dominate will fall off and it'll just be kind of a classic, like there will always be like three main dating apps, the way there'll always be three main social apps, but like who those apps are is always going to be what's changing. Do you think you would go back to dating apps if you found yourself single again? Oh God, I don't think I could. I I probably would at some point, but... I don't think I could do it. I think uh, because I think the idea of setting up a profile sounds like I would be doing it with my eyes closed, just like sighing. Um, <laughs> and I don't, I don't think I basically, I just think I would be so unhappy to be there. And that's not a good energy to bring into your dating life. Fair. And I've always been this like woo woo, but I've always been like a big believer of the whole like, if you're not forcing it, if you're not looking for it, it'll happen. And dating apps are like the ultimate forcing it, looking for it. And so for me, it just does not work. But also for the reasons outlined, it sounds like if I were to join now, I would like it even less than the first time I was on it. Catherine Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Catherine Lindsay writes about internet culture for the newsletter Embedded. And that's it for today's show. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell, Anna Phillips, and Patrick Fort. Our show is edited by Paige Osborne. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. TBD is also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. If you're a fan of the show, I have a small request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. We'll be back next week with more episodes. I'm Shana Roth, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary. You can find me on Instagram and threads. I'm at Shana R. That's a C-H-E-Y-N-A. Same for X, although to a much lesser extent. I also now have a Substack. Thanks for listening. Hold up. 